Hello everyone, I'm Tamara Banks and welcome back to Dialogue Denver DA. Mitch, always great to see you. Tamara, great to see you. Welcome back. Thanks. We have a really cool guest here with a uh, really awesome organization he's trying yes, to Yes, we do. We have technician Dean Christofferson with us and he has really spearheaded the movement to create a Denver Police Museum. So, technician, tell us why a Denver Police Museum? I know we have a firefighter museum. Why a police museum? Well, several years ago when I worked out of state in a different jurisdiction, I was researching a fallen officer who'd been killed in 1917. And in the course of that, I tried gathering up information and researching it, but unfortunately a lot of records had been destroyed or were missing. And I thought, you know, I'll go to the local historical societies. And uh, they didn't have anything. I said, do you have anything on Sheriff so-and-so? And they said, why would we have that? And I said, well, because he was a lawman, and you know, in those early days, you know, the lawman was a guy who kept order, collected your taxes, levied your fines, and you know, went down those dark, scary alleys. Uh, so it kind of motivated me to start preserving the culture of my profession, uh, and and start uh, either researching it, finding the information, and uh, stockpiling the uh, the artifacts. So it's you and an organization that's sort of spearheading this. Tell us about the whole movement. Well, several years ago, we formed the 501c3 nonprofit to pursue having a uh, state-of-the-art police museum in Denver, showcasing the 155 years of uh, Denver's history as told through the police department's eyes. I bet there's some pretty interesting stories you could take us back to and, and give us an idea of what's happening back there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there really isn't much that doesn't happen in, uh, in Denver or any, any city or county, for that matter, without uh, the police or the sheriff being involved somehow. Do you want to talk about some of the goodies you have here? I see this amazing cup, this trophy cup. What is that about? Well, that's something you probably wouldn't see now, but uh, in 1909, uh, Officer Art Wachter from the uh, Mounted Patrol uh, rode his horse Paddy, which was a painted uh, pinto. Uh, he rode that in the Western Stock Show's gate competition and took first place. And I see you have a badge there. Those are, that's actually got jewels on it, that badge. Well, not so much jewels, but it's handmade by a jeweler. Ah, You'll okay. notice uh, several of the badges that are there. Some are very plain, some are a little bit more ornate, but uh, the one that's actually in the case uh, is handmade by a jeweler out of, uh, out of gold, mm -hmm. probably about 10 or 12 carats, somewhere in that fashion. But again, handmade, all riveted, put together. It truly is a piece of art by a jeweler. And are there other municipalities in the metro area throughout the state that have museums dedicated to law enforcement? The only one that I know of right off the top of my head is down in uh, Cripple Creek. They've just converted the old, one of their old buildings to a uh, uh, outlaws and lawman type museum, mm -hmm. uh, jail museum. Uh, there are a couple of smaller ones, uh, different jurisdictions have small displays in their lobbies. And, uh, but nationwide, it's getting to be pretty popular. We're uh, affiliated with a consortium of police museums from across the country and they have conventions each year that we uh, send a representative to. And Mitch, will the, the DA's office be part of the museum as well? Well, the museum, you know, it's up to the museum, but uh, they have asked us and, and I'm going to provide them. We actually have a wall of every elected DA mm -hmm. that goes back to before actually Denver existed and when Denver was part of the Kansas Territory. So we've collected a picture of every single elected DA and there's actually been quite a few of them because most of them used to serve one term and it was usually three years. So we have a portrait of each and every one of them and what I've done is put them on a thumb drive and I'm going to give them to the museum because you know Denver, although at the time there was a much bigger jurisdiction that the DAs covered, mm -hmm. they went from Sheridan Boulevard all the way to the Kansas border. So Sheridan is still our border. That's the only border that's still there. Mm -hmm. We're just the city and county of Denver. But originally, I think the first three or four DAs actually had jurisdiction over a vast area. So if something happened in Weld County, which wasn't Weld County, the Denver district attorney or the district attorney from this judicial district actually tried those cases and would send people out to Fort Collins, those types of places, Weld County to try those cases. So there's always been a strong connection with the Denver Police Department. Uh, sometimes if you look at the history, the Denver District Attorney and maybe one or two of the officers might be in trouble and actually get charged by the Denver District Attorney's Office. But I think the museum's going to recognize that connection. We're going to at least provide those photographs. And then, I don't know if people know, but on our Facebook, we do an historic fact about the Denver District Attorney's Office every single day. Mm -hmm. So it may be a case from 
in the 1920s, maybe a case from as recently as Bill Ritter or something that we did a, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And I think it's really important for institutions like the Denver Police Department, like the Denver District Attorney's Office, to remember where they came from, to remember what it's all about as far as history goes. And we were talking earlier, and you know, Dean can tell you that a lot of the things we see today happening, same kind of things that were happening in the 20s, were happening in the 30s, the wardrobe's different, but the crimes, what people were trying to do are the same. So it's really interesting to go back, and I'll tell you, the things that they have over there at the museum, the things that they have collected, uh, it's incredible to see. Oh, I bet. And to your point about knowing where we come from, I bet you have a lot of information about all the first, the first female officer, the first black officer. Tell us about those folks. And particularly, let's start with the first black officer. We have this idea, this myth that there were no black officers in a great time period in the 40s in our history here in Denver, but that's not right. And there, well, there's a reason for that. Right. And, and we have a lot of research to do, but we'll be putting together a display for the Blair Caldwell Museum for the month of May that uh, will kick off on May 6. But uh, again, a popular misconception is that we didn't have black officers uh, for a very long time. But after the great American Civil War, a lot of the exodus north either joined the military or came to the settlements. Their skill sets were valuable and very much needed in these areas. Uh, it was a natural migration for a lot of them to go into law enforcement, especially if they had military backgrounds. And uh, our earliest officers, uh, black officers, by the mid-1870s when we formed our first police department, were already being considered and were working as in capacities as special or part-time officers. And by 1880, they'd become a voting block in the city. And back then you had to be elected to office as a policeman. So they had to be elected by the citizens of Denver and we had our two first officers in 1880 that were elected. All the officers had to be elected? Yeah, all the officers, yep. Huh. The mayor could appoint special officers or emergency appointments, but basically yeah, you had to be elected by your precincts. And, and what about the, the first female officers? When did they come on board? Our first female officer that we recognize would have been uh, Miss Sadie Likens. Uh, around 18, um, 1888, 1889, somewhere in that ballpark, maybe even as early as 1882. We're still finding some records on that. Uh, but she was, prior to that, they had housed juvenile prisoners, female prisoners, and male prisoners all in the same cells. And somewhere along the way, somebody thought that's probably not such a good idea. Yeah. So they hired a matron to take care of the female prisoners and the children, and uh, she, was, uh, she was chosen. And you know, her history is incredible because she had done a lot of work as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so she, uh, during, the, during the different wars, she was recognized by veterans groups. And actually, if people are interested, there's a monument to her up in the park in front of the Capitol because she was recognized by the veterans that she had worked with for so long that they put together the money to build a fountain. monument or a fountain to her. Mm -hmm. So if you're walking up there and you stop and take a look, she's the first female employee, I believe, of the Denver Police Department. Yeah, and she has a distinction of uh, having the governor arrested by the U.S. Marshal and clapped in irons in jail for the day uh, when she was fired because she was a party of the wrong affiliation after an election. Politics were a little bit different <laughs> back then. The governor actually played a much bigger role in city government yeah. than does now, and that's part of why uh, the, there was a Denver DA who actually was in the Senate mm -hmm. who it's called the Rush Amendment and it got Denver its independence from the governor. The governor used to come in, a new governor and appoint the, the sheriff, mm -hmm. the police chief, the fire chief of Denver and really the people of Denver did not appreciate the governor telling them what to do in the city right. and so there was a, oftentimes city a lot Baltimore. of problems. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, there was a big riot down uh, where the governor sent down the militia because two guys wouldn't step down that he appointed and he didn't like what they did. And then we almost had a full war down at the old city hall. Both sides were lined up. The cannons that are up at the Capitol were facing the Denver city hall. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much the end of that. And then the legislature did something. There was a constitutional amendment and put in place to make Denver independent of the governor. So when we look back at history, we get a chance to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And one of the things I found in some of the things that you are bringing to the museum is that the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, was really powerful, particularly in the 20s, right. from Governor Morley to Mayor Stapleton, and what was it, six um, Denver district judges, six or seven district judges? I 
Pretty much everybody. You know, after the movie Birth of a Nation came out, uh, one of the first major motion pictures that people really could go and see, uh, it really did glamorize the Klan and caused mm -hmm. a resurgence. And, you know, my what I've found in a number of cases is that a lot of people had joined, again, mostly as a, either a fad or, or, you know, just because it was a social club to get into. And you almost literally couldn't get a job in government service unless you, you know, had the secret handshake. Um, What's kind of a unique thing to, to juxtapose against that is um, back in its day, uh, it's kind of the internet of its day became the wire photos and the, the speedy ability to get news across the country. Mm -hmm. So people were getting these reports from down south of these heinous acts done performed by the Klan in some of those places. And a lot of people said, that's not what I, I don't want to be a part of that. So by the 1930s, you saw a dramatic decline um, in the numbers of the Klan. Then when Dr. I think it was Galen Locke uh, passed away, uh, that pretty much nipped it in the bud for a long time as a very viable uh, large-scale um, uh, organization and control. But what's kind of interesting is our first black officer killed in the line of duty, uh, Willie Steam, mm -hmm. 1921, uh, was ambushed at a club. And uh, that's at the height of the Klan era. And what happened is Dewey Bailey, the mayor, the, the mayor and um, the chief of police at that time, they uh, actually paid for his funeral and they took care of him and the city council actually passed a proclamation recognizing him for his service in his line of duty death. You know when the Klan was really strong there was one person that stood up against them. Uh, we named the jail after him oh, and cool. some of his other relatives but he was the Denver district attorney it was Phil Van Sice mm -hmm. and he had been a uh, hero in World War One. He was elected district attorney, and he really fought the Klan tooth and nail and did a lot of things that today we wouldn't get away with. For instance, um, he sent down Judge Otto Moore, who eventually became a Supreme Court justice, to break into the Klan's uh, office, he and then the next DA. And uh, they were looking for typewriters that had been used to produce a list that then was used to bring down jurors. So the Klan infiltrated the entire city. Wow. But one of the worst things they did was they put Klansmen on all the juries. And so you'd have uh, somebody that was Jewish or somebody that was Catholic, horrible crime committed against them, maybe a murder, they'd walk the guy. Because the corruption of the Klan infiltrated the city, the judicial system, and the entire thing. And I think actually, at one point there was a falling out with Mayor Stapleton in the Klan because he refused to appoint a police chief that was a member of the Klan. Yeah. They tried to recall him and then eventually he did appoint a Klansman to yeah. be the head of the Denver Police Department and then the Klan supported him in the recall election and he got reelected. Politics were, were a whole different ball game uh, back then. Again, you even saw as, as late as the 1890s and, and as early into the 1920s. Uh, again, Police officers, a lot of them were, were appointed or hired based upon your political affiliation. And we've got some newspaper articles where if an officer didn't carry a precinct, for example, um, he would lose his job. Uh, and, okay. and not to get too far off on a tangent on the politics of it, but um, at that time, if you had a standing police force of, let's say, 300 officers, just as a random number, and you were 50 officers short through attrition and the city council hadn't approved anything to, for hiring, uh, what would happen is the mayor could appoint 50 police officers in an emergency situation. Now imagine the clout you've got back in those days when every cop walked a beat and he could put 50 loyal police officers out on, in, in the precincts that he didn't carry and uh, they would sometimes try to steer the votes towards the incumbent or wow. the one run. There was actually a detective by the name of Green yeah. that carried a county, a, a precinct down near Larimer that he would deliver the votes. Yeah. And uh, they called it the Green Precinct or Green <laughs> County because uh, he was very astute when it came to delivering votes. He was very astute at the counting of votes and just some flat out fraud sometimes. But uh, he was during Mayor Spears time, which was really a political machine. They had certain officers in place that played a large role in keeping those people in power. Then I think what one or two of the first black officers that were killed were actually killed at a voting precinct because they showed up to try to make sure things were good and I think they were shot at by Denver that, sheriffs. That was, uh, well that was actually in 1900. This is again how nasty politics get. And then uh, 
Uh, I can also, you know, Bat Masterson, his last shootout as a lawman, was at a polling booth with the Denver police inside as they were stuffing ballots. Uh, but the 1900 uh, shootout uh, that uh, the DA is referring to is, um, it was a very, ten uh, very tumultuous time. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at the Russia Amendment and, and independence. So again, you would have one political party at the state level, at the county level. Uh, for uh, Arapahoe County, you have another one at the city level, and then everybody jockeying for positions. So um, there's a couple of the polling booths that were in play. So the police department swore in about uh, probably a good two or 300 extra policemen to staff those, which wasn't unusual. They're kind of the reserve officers of their day. They were paid for the day, part-time, that sort of thing. And uh, so they were lining up one of the booths, and uh, the opposing faction, the, the sheriff had been told he couldn't swear in any deputies. And uh, there was a federal court order mandate out of district court for that. Well, what happened is they'd convinced the U.S. Marshal to swear in a bunch of deputies in the wee hours of the morning in a tavern or a bar, uh, and then told them they'd have $10 at the end of the day. They were given a revolver and a badge, and then given free drinks. And they were told to go out and disrupt certain polls. So a disturbance ensued when they opened the polls that morning and the crowd was coming towards them and it was these um, illegally sworn in lawmen and uh, they came up and when one of our officers went to push him back with his baton, and again you have to remember they wore the long coats back then so their guns were underneath their coats, uh, they went to push him back, some of the drunken deputies pulled out their guns and started shooting and actually wound up uh, killing Stuart Harvey. Mm. Uh, they shot Samuel Carpenter who subsequently died 10 years later of his injuries, they were so horrendous, mm. he had a number of other people injured. Wow, I think uh, the Denver Police Department standards are a little bit higher now. <laughs> yeah, a badge, yes. a gun, and all the drinks you can right, have. Right. How do you make this all happen? All this great information that you have and your team have, what do you need to make this uh, dream a reality? Well, where it started, uh, the, the best thing was uh, the people. And we have a very, very good team. Uh, our board, we're all volunteers. Uh, we all do it uh, as a side, passionate venture that uh, has, has really got um, some momentum in the last year or so. We've got about 43 volunteers, uh, current officers, retired officers, family members, widows, and people from the private sector who just have partnered up on this. And uh, we, we are looking at it again as a 501c3, and one of the reasons we, we did that, it's kind of the standard model across the country. Um, that being that we stand alone to enhance the department. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and part of that reason too is we don't want to be a budget item that takes money away from patrol and the safety of the citizens of Denver. So it also gives us a little bit of creativity on our on how we find our funding sources uh, and be a little bit more aggressive, grants, loans, that sort of thing. Um, and, and the second thing to be blunt is control. Mm -hmm. you, we can tell the honest story of the Denver Police Department and um, I had one of the chiefs ask me uh, why isn't this a Denver uh, museum under the, the department? I said well Basically, sir, to be blunt, you may support this, but three chiefs down the road may not be as engaged in history as you are. So, uh, so again, we want long-term, standalone. Uh, we want these artifacts to be around for the next 300 years, our target goal. And what about your, your building space? Do you need space as well? Um, our target goal for that is going to be at least a 25,000-foot display area, state-of-the-art, interactive. Uh, a couple of the things uh, uh, that we have to cover are, of course, going to be you know the education, uh, component, community outreach, uh, children. Uh, we also want to have it available, so it's got to be, it, it's going to have to be able to keep itself afloat. Merchandising, uh, be available for venues. I mean, what kid wouldn't want to have his birthday party at the police museum or, <laughs> or host events, dignitaries, department type events. So a lot of that will come around with, um, again, about a 25,000 square foot area. Uh, we're ballparking, you know, several million dollars. But again, uh, there's a lot of support. The, the, the groundswell of support has been phenomenal. We started small, we started within the department, we've worked, branched out to the retirees, and now we're starting to get a lot more of the, uh, the public involved. And, and again, we're not building a shrine to the DPD, we're telling Denver's history a unique slice of that told through their eyes. Yeah, and it's not always positive. I mean, right. we have police officers that were involved in beating people. Uh, we had a police chief that, Delaney was his name, he jumped on a train and got out of town. Uh, after beating up his girlfriend's plumber coming out of the house. So uh, he was brought back and prosecuted. But uh, those are the kind of things that I think people need to see. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that this museum be down by the Mint in the area where our art museums are. We've talked about some different buildings potential there. I think it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. One of the things I might think you might want to ask though, they're putting together an oral history right now mm. of a lot of those officers that we're losing because they're older and they may have been on the job 
20, 30 some odd years, but years ago they retired. The other thing that they're doing there is talking to people connected to law enforcement. So I know recently they talked to the Denver coroner, uh, jo um, George Ogura. Mm -hmm. George is about 95, and George was mm -hmm. the coroner for Denver over a span of time that they need to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna have those oral histories there too. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is really an important asset to Denver, it'll make Denver better, and obviously it's the kind of place that I'd love to go and visit when would, I get the opportunity. It would really be fun and so educational. We just have a couple minutes left. Sure. How would this benefit the community at large? Say somebody who's never even had any involvement with the police at all, what does it matter to them? Well, if you, uh, I always use this as my sales pitch. Um, whether it's the 1800s, all through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. The dime novels, the early talkies, the film noir movies, Dragnet, Adam 12, Matt Dillon from Gunsmoke. Uh, look at the top 10 shows, the top 10 periodicals, the top 10 books. They're crime drama written. Uh, in whatever, whatever it's uh, uh, murder, NCIS, I think they've got one in almost every city in the <laughs> country now. We need uh, for Denver. <laughs> people are fascinated by my profession, and we just want to give an honest, perspective on how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, let people come in and see what we do, how we do it, put their hands on things, look at stuff, and, uh, and, and answer their questions. I education is the key to all this. And Tamara, if I can, if anybody watching is interested in helping these people put this together, they want to volunteer, they have a website, and I'm sure we'll give that information. And I'll tell you, any donations they can make to this good cause, I think that it is really important that we understand the history of Denver that we understand what law enforcement has been like throughout Denver and how society interacted with them. Anybody that can donate even a dollar, these guys will take it, I guarantee yeah. you, and they will put it to good use. And the next generation of people that grow up in Denver, this will be something that they can go and be proud of. And again, this isn't a city fund. This is not right. a city funded event. This right. is uh, a museum that would be standing autonomous from the city budget yep. Donations are, are really what you're yep. looking for. 501c3 tax, tax deductible What's charitable the donation. www.denverpolicemuseum.org. Mm -hmm. and, and law enforcement, no matter where you're at, um, if you look at a community as a fabric, you've got a lot of different threads that weave through it, but there's one thread that runs through every community, and that's law enforcement. Good or bad, you have to have it. And uh, mm -hmm. overall, it is a fairly misunderstood profession in some cases, but again, we strive to to do what we can. Well, I can't wait till it opens. <laughs> and we'll just have to come to you for all those answers. <laughs> I'll be retired. Hopefully we'll have an expert by then. <laughs> okay, you sound like an expert to me. Good luck uh, to those behind the effort to create a Denver Police Museum. And thank you to technician Dean Christofferson for being our guest today with Denver DA Mitch Morrissey on this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. I'm Tamara Banks, we'll see you next time. Thank you.